not just any sightseer. Hugh Hardy is the architect behind some of New York's most famous sites. In fact, they call him Mr. New York, the epitome of debonair sophistication. And if this swell party in his downtown loft seems a throwback to another time, Well, that's because Hugh Hardy Great. has a passion Great. for preserving the past. Now. Tomorrow, the curtain will go up on the just-renovated Radio City Music Hall. That's the color I've been waiting to see. And while the audience is celebrating the rebirth of a legendary New York landmark, no other or not, the crowd will also be celebrating the work of this legendary New York architect. Why do you care? I mean, why don't you just say, ah, it's my turn now. I can make it like I want it. Because nothing could be better than this building in 1932. Nobody could be so arrogant <laughs> as to think they could improve Radio City. It can't be done. I read somewhere that you had said that it doesn't really matter how a building looks if it's not useful to the people True. who are working True. and, and True. living in it. True. It, it, it's much more complicated than an exercise in aesthetics. I think what's important is for the public to be able to engage directly in its architecture. It's a huge responsibility to go around changing the environment. It's very successful. It's like upholstering the world's largest sofa. It's an amazing job. We're going to wake it up with its original color schemes and people are going to be startled. And if I fail, they will come and say, oh, look how they've tarted this place up. As this textured background goes around the curves, you get the highlights of the foil shining through. His work always That's has a theatrical flair. No surprise, since he started out as a Broadway there, set designer before he put his Princeton architecture degree to work. And over the years, Hardy has pumped life back into landmarks like the New Amsterdam and New Victory Theaters, two anchors of the Spiffed Up Times Square district. One has to be deferential. One has to complement the work of the original architect. However, I, I believe strongly that you can't possibly restore anything really. It can't be done because even if you put everything back the way it was and you knew how to do that, times have changed, our sensibilities have changed. <laughs> It's hard to believe when you see it today. But not long ago, Bryant Park, right behind the New York Public Library, was ruled by drug dealers. What were you trying to achieve? Exactly when... what you see. <laughs> exactly what I've exactly got. Exactly what to get everybody to come together at the heart of the city on 42nd Street. But it was Hardy's cleanup plan for this area was controversial because of the restaurant he designed to nestle right up to the library itself. So to get commerce mixed up with something so sacred was profane. But Hardy and his partners in the firm of Hardy, Holtzman, Pfeiffer and Associates have never minded challenging convention. We were once called the bad boys of architecture when we made aggressive, funny buildings in the 60s. We were the first to embrace mechanical systems as a part of architecture, in part because no one else had done it, in part because we couldn't afford to do otherwise. And in order to organize it, we used outrageous colors. The firm has designed projects all over the country. Does he have a particular look, a particular style? Now, I think Hugh Hardy's work has a particular spirit, but not a particular look. You will recognize certain things as having a quality of exuberance and passion. Paul and Goldberger, architecture critic for The New Yorker, Yorker has studied Hardy's work. Have you ever walked in and said, gee, this just didn't work? I think I, I, there's never been anything that I fundamentally thought was sort of conceptually wrong from the start that he was done, I don't think. This is New York's 59th Street Bridge. And this will be Bridge Market, the space under the bridge, first constructed at the turn of the century. 
Hardy spent 12 years convincing the city to let him design a new use for it. Um, all right, well, you said I wouldn't believe it. Isn't it inside. remarkable? <laughs> it There's is, no place like it in the city. It is incredible. These wonderful terracotta columns go up into vaults, which are made by the Catalan brothers, Gustavino. So what will be in here? I mean, we see it's already building to two levels. There'll be a restaurant at the upper level here. Out in the plaza, there's a great garden. Below is a home furnishing shop. And people are going to come here. You watch. It's going to be like bees to honey. The elegant loft where Hardy lives was designed by his wife of 33 years, Tiziana, also an architect. Do you like living in what's space that someone else designed? What's interesting is that she's far more interested in the more austere. Uh, she doesn't even like moldings. I love moldings. Well, I had to, I, I was allowed two things. One is that this wall is not parallel to that wall. It, it's slightly angled so that as you move back and forth, you're not aware of it, but it makes no, it. No, you're not. Well, I am now that you've said it to me. It makes it less boring. Now that you said it to me, I really And the other thing I was allowed is, in the bedroom, there's wallpaper. Bianco or rosso? Bianco. Do you, you know, when you look out here, though, for you, it must be a great feeling that you've been such a part of this city. I mean, oh, yeah. it's got to be a... It's a great garden. <laughs> it is. This whole place is a garden. Only it's a... A magical garden that Hardy wants to bring to life in the new Radio City. These what do you want people to feel like when they walk in? I want them to feel splendid. One of the great well, things about a great theater is it makes you look good. You feel good because you look great. And at Radio City and so many other places in New York, if you're feeling great, it just may be because Hugh Hardy has been at work. That's how it will always be, and nothing else can ever.